Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the Dressage Today podcast. This is your host, Lindsay Paulson. This is the time of year when slogging out to the barn after work, when it is cold and dark, can just be downright miserable. So I thought we could all use a little bit of inspiration. In the following episode, I'm sharing some inspiring short stories from important women in our dressage community, including Lyndon Gray, Jane Savoy, and Sarah Geike. These are all stories that came from our Dressage Today magazine archives, and they are reflections on philosophical lessons, if you will, from dressage. These popular figures in our sport share a lesson from their life called What I Wish I'd Known Then. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I did, and I hope they breathe some fresh life into your riding and your goals this winter season. Hey there, I'm Jennifer Malachi. And I'm Lindsay Paulson. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage, from leading riders to local level dressage heroes, We're talking training advice, horse care tips, and stories to inspire your own dressage journey. Tune in, then tack up. We'll be back to the show in just a quick moment, but first, a message from our sponsor. Smart packs are a simple, foolproof way to make sure your horse always gets the right supplements. All you have to do is choose the supplements that your horse needs, and Smart Pack will pack them in convenient, customized daily doses that make feeding time fast and easy. And Smart Packs aren't just easier for you, they're better for your horse too. Because they come in pre measured doses, are clearly labeled, and sealed for freshness, there's never any doubt that your horse is getting the absolute best. Smart Packs are not only better for your horse, but also better for the environment. Unlike most buckets, Smart packs are made from 100% recycled PET plastics and can be recycled again. Visit smartpack.com or call 1 800 461 8898 to learn more about how Smart Pack can help you take great care of your horse today. In this short story from London Gray, she reflects on the willingness and generosity of horses and why it's important to look at riding as a two way conversation between partners. London represented the United States in two Olympic Games, in World Championships, and a World Cup. She has served on many committees and founded Dressage for Kids, a nonprofit organization that provides educational and competitive opportunities for young riders. This is London Gray on the willingness and generosity of the horse. One of the things that strikes me very strongly now, that I absolutely wasn't aware of as a young rider, is what generous creatures horses really are. Why do they let us train them and make them work whenever we wish? There are other animals that are not trainable. Now that I don't ride anymore, I watch riders, horses, and their reactions more, and I've developed an incredible respect for their willingness. Very often, as riders, we don't realize how good-willing our horses are and think they turn against us whenever we run into resistance. I find many riders take it personally. He's doing this to me, we often think. How dare he do this to me? When I ran into a problem as a young rider, I felt that my horse simply didn't want to do a certain movement. I accused him of actively trying to be difficult or trying to make my life hard. I thought he didn't want to learn. Then I tried to make him do this or that, wanting him to obey. Now I look at the dressage training process from a different perspective. I spent my life trying to look at it from the horse's point of view, figuring out how I can explain to him what I want. Instead of approaching him from the how do I make him do what I want angle, I now ask myself, how can I express my wishes to him so that he wants to do it for me? Part of this comes from my effort to tell horses what they're doing right as opposed to what they're doing wrong. It's a bit more of the reward approach, letting them know when they did it right through praising as opposed to telling them, no, that's wrong. I always try to put them in situations that set them up for success. I develop every exercise in a logical, systematic way, each step building onto the next, to ensure that my horse understands every single step along the way. It's like learning how to read. First, you have to learn letters, then words, then phrases, then sentences, then paragraphs, and then books. 
Compare a book to a Grand Prix test. Picture an upper-level dressage horse that has reading skills to a greater or lesser extent. When it appears that the book doesn't make sense, we run into a training problem and have to go back to check if he understands the sentence, the phrase, the word, or the letters. If he doesn't understand the basic words, then the sentences and paragraphs won't work. Horses live very much in the moment and always honestly express what they're feeling. We just have to learn how to listen to them. If a rider's demands comes out of the blue, our horses are likely to resist. It's their way of telling us that they hurt, they don't understand, they're tired or frustrated, and they're sick of it. I think of everything I do with my horses as a two-way conversation. In order to have such a conversation, one of the party speaks and the other one listens. Then we swap places. The one that was listening now expresses himself, and the one who was talking now listens. Then you have a true partnership and understanding with your horse. This piece from Jane Savoy is a reminder for riders to shift their perspective when it comes to competing. In Jane's famous words, it isn't just about the ribbons. Here, she shares an important piece of advice to focus more on your personal goals rather than basing your success on an outcome that is dependent on external factors, like a judge's score. Jane Savoy is a USDF bronze, silver, and gold medalist and has been a U.S. representative in international competition. She is a noted author and has written several books, including It's Not Just About the Ribbons. This is Jane Savoy on learning how to have the right perspective at shows. Satisfaction in competition can be increased by simply making it a more personal event instead of basing success on ribbons. That's what I wish I'd known early in my career. Back then, my primary goal was to get a high score and place well in every class. Before the test, I would look in the program to see who else was in the class, and then I'd check the scoreboard afterward. If I didn't place well, or if I got a low score, I went home somewhat disappointed. In the course of time, I found that this approach to showing created a lot of pressure and took away the joy. For the most part, there are so many things not in one's control. Judges are not machines, and they prioritize things differently in their minds, causing scores to be varied. Other factors that are out of the rider's control are the weather and the footing. If you drive home from a show and base your total opinion on whether you've been successful or not in one person's opinion, the weather, the quality of footing, your ribbon count, or your score, you're cruising for discouragement, disappointment, and frustration. Instead of letting external factors decide my success at a show, I now make my goals more personal, which gives me more control. I'm able to approach a show in a much more relaxed manner, and because I'm more relaxed, I tend to come away feeling successful and satisfied. For example, last winter, my horse had his debut at fourth level. A week before the show, I sat down and thought about my goals for this show. I came up with three things. Since it was my horse's first appearance at fourth level, I wanted things to go well in the double bridle, I wanted the tempi changes to be clean, and I wanted to really ride into my corners and use them. I rode two tests that I thought went well, fulfilling my personal goals in both tests. Interestingly enough, although I thought my horse went the same in both tests, I got a low score for one and a high score for the other. Since I didn't base my feelings of success on the judge's opinions, but on my personal goals, I went home feeling perfectly satisfied. Everybody can make personal goals like that. If you're a training level rider, you might have a tendency to get nervous and stop breathing during your test. Your personal goal could be to breathe through your test. If your legs turn to jelly at the last show, you might want to make your personal goal to use your legs. If your horse bucked at the canter depart the last time you competed, your goal might be to have obedient canter departs. To become a happier competitor, I tell people to see things in shades of gray. Things are a little bit better. Instead of black and white, you either won the class or blew it. For example, if you did four canter departs at the last show and picked up the wrong lead twice, but now you picked up the right lead three times out of four in this show, then you're making progress. Perhaps your horse was also going a little bit more forward, you were sitting the trot a little bit better, or your horse was a little bit less spooky at a show. All those small successes add up to being a whole lot better, and both you and your horse can finish your ride with a tremendous sense of satisfaction. I change my goals almost every time I go to a competition. It makes competition much more fun and interesting. I randomly pick something I've been working toward. 
if I've been working on tippy changes and I think they go well about 90% of the time when I'm schooling at home, but they're still 10% when they're not quite confirmed, then a great personal goal would be to turn those 10% into reliable tempi changes. Many times people at shows say to me, you look like the only one who's having a good time. I answer, indeed, I do have a good time. I've learned how to have the right perspective in showing, and interestingly enough, at the end of the day, besides just having more fun through that approach, the placings and ribbons work out in the right way. There's some sort of a bonus of having approached the competition with that kind of a mind. Last but not least, we are hearing from Sarah Geike on her journey to develop feel as a rider. I think this is a topic most of us struggle with as we're all on that never-ending quest to improve our feel. Sarah is a Grand Prix dressage trainer, instructor, and clinician, and is also an FEI four-star judge and USCFS judge. This is Sarah Geike on developing feel. It's a journey. I started riding at an early age and was very fortunate to receive consistent quality instruction. Years spent in U.S. Pony Club as well as a BHSAI certificate from England, helped to give me a good theoretical base of knowledge in dressage fundamentals. I also had a lot of success competing in combined training as well as dressage. Early on, I rode in regular clinics with top German trainer Walter Christensen, who came to New England four times a year. We were all so hungry for the knowledge he had and was so willing to impart to us. There was one particular lesson that was a turning point for me. In it, I discovered the feel and influence of the seat and weight aids in creating a supple, swinging, connected back in the horse. In this particular lesson, I was riding a retraining project, a horse that was not the most supple in his back. The clinician, with his timely input, allowed me the time to ride and work through the issues using several higher level exercises, one of which was particularly helpful in getting me to that aha moment. The shoulder in exercise helped me to improve engagement, suppleness, and straightness. In the half halt exercise, I learned the importance of correct aids and their timing and of giving immediately after the half halt. That was a pivotal moment in my riding where I truly felt what should be happening in my own body as well as the horses. All of this opened up a new level of understanding of riding timing, feel for the horse, and reacting in a proactive way to what was happening underneath me. As the saying goes, you do not truly own it and know it until you have felt it. To get to this point required a huge amount of trust between the horse, the trainer, and myself. This was a revelation to me as I began to understand the nature of the training and learning process involved in dressage. What exactly happened was the letting go in my seat to allow my seat bones to sit into the horse in a connected, deep, but also soft way. In other words, sitting into the horse and not on top of him. I instinctively knew that it was correct by how the horse felt. Another interesting observation, how I used my body did not feel anything like I thought it should. My preconceived idea was very different from the reality of the true feeling. This lesson took place many years ago, but I can still picture it in my mind like it was yesterday. The teaching style of this trainer might be considered old school by today's standards. The lesson was structured, but the information and feedback from the trainer was well-timed. There was no constant talking. I was given time to think for myself and figure it out. I was given the freedom to make mistakes, which I now know are necessary to develop feel. Today, lessons are so often spoon-fed to the rider, with instructors putting into words what to do every stride to get the desired result. Like so much in our lives, we want everything yesterday. Learning to ride well takes a lifetime, and as a well-loved trainer once stated, if we all knew how hard this was, we would have never started in the first place. But I think the journey of learning about the horse and developing him as a partner through dressage training is well worth it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dressage Today podcast. To learn more from Lendon, Jane, and Sarah, be sure to head over to dressagetoday.com to read more of the pieces they've written for Dressage Today in the past. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. You can learn more from Dressage Today and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com 
or you can visit our new training video site, Dressage Today On Demand. To learn more, visit ondemand.dressagetoday.com. And for daily dressage training tips and advice, give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Happy riding! If you're still listening, don't forget to leave us a review and tell your friends about our podcast. If you have feedback or you'd like to be a guest on our show, shoot us an email at dressagetoday at aimmedia.com. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Active Interest Media and the Equine Network.